Welcome to Off 63rd with Gerard McClendon. Cabrini Green is now a memory for good times, horrible crimes, and everything in between. But what about the future of low-income housing in Chicago? You heard the president make his case, but at this point in Libya, it may be more trouble making than trouble shooting. The anti-abortion billboard campaign in Inglewood is causing major problems, and a stolen iPhone leads to a stairway death. Are times really that tough, people? Call me now. This is Off 63rd, Chicago, from the beach to the burbs. Thank you for joining us. You're watching Off 63rd, and hey, you can call me right now. The number is 773-487-3630, 773-487-3630. We're also on simulcast on the web at www.wkkc.fm, and we're on the radio at 89.3. FM. Joining me tonight in the Off 63rd Forum, president of Urban Strategies Group, writer for the Jerusalem Post, radio host, and a Palestinian who has a Jewish wife, Ray Hanania. Also the co-host of Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Conservatism, editor for RedCounty.com, and co-founder of Publius Forum, Warner Todd Houston and award-winning Chicago journalist who has made several appearances on CNN's Headline News and the Nancy Grace Show, ChicagoDefender.com's web editor, Kathy Cheney. Welcome to Off 63rd, you three. Thank you for having us. I appreciate you coming out on a lovely kind of spring day. And it's sad because the stories this week are horrendous. Let's first start with a story that has troubled me for years. Project housing, public housing, Cabrini Green. This demolition marks the end of an era. Uh, the last building is about to be pummeled. They're dismantling it now. Where do the displaced residents go? Let's start with Ray Hanania. Talk to me about public housing. Is it truly an experiment? Uh, should public housing have ever taken place? What do you think? Well, when I covered City Hall, public housing was uh, a place where you could almost guarantee votes for elected office. Um, everybody promised that they were going to try to find a better life for people that were living in public housing. I don't think they ever really did that. What I think they have done, though, is move a lot of the people that were in public housing into the suburbs yeah. outside of Chicago. Yeah, yeah, you know, and sometimes that can be troubling. I'm going to you next, Warner. Public housing, um, thorn in the side for a lot of people, not exactly a picket fence type life Certainly for many not. people. What do you think? Uh, great experiment, uh, is it, were they called projects for a reason? What are your thoughts well, on public housing? Well, it certainly housing? was a failed concept. I mean, and, and, and it isn't just in Chicago either. I mean, everywhere it's been tried, it, it really has failed miserably. So, I, I mean, I would prefer seeing people dispersed uh, into areas where they can perhaps thrive much more easily than in areas where they're forced into a sort of lifestyle that's just not conducive to, to thriving. Yeah, yeah. Kathy, we've all <laughs> watched Good Times. Absolutely, the Evans <laughs> I mean, family. I'll, I'll be the first one to say, I'm a huge Good Times fan. Oh, I you, watch it every time it comes know, on, DVR. <laughs> that's right, the Evans exactly. family. Uh, based on life in Chicago, uh, Cabrini, Cabrini Green. Green. Of course, it was filmed in LA. Right. But, but talk to me about Cabrini Green, about Robert Taylor Holmes, failed experiment, good for some of the residents, or just a bad concept or idea? I Kathy. believe it was a bad concept all the way around because it forced classism. You know, there's just, you know, that's us and then there's them. Um, it just, it was a failed, it, it just wasn't a good idea. Um, and like you said, where, you know, it was for voting and everything, we saw that with Robert Taylor Holmes when that came down. Was it the third, fourth ward or whatever that was in, but I, largely the third ward. Yeah. That just voting really went down. Let's talk about classism, and I, I see you're chomping at the bit here, Warner. Let's talk about the the you know project living or public housing and the suburbs. Bit by bit, these buildings have been dismantled all along the Dan Ryan. Okay, mm -hmm. 
the people have to go somewhere. Now, should they have been cut checks to go elsewhere or should there have been a little bit more control over that? Your thoughts, anyone? Listen, I, first of all, the whole system was corrupt for a lot of reasons. One, we put them there because uh, nobody wanted to deal with them. Hmm. Uh, the media didn't care about them. The only time the media cared about them, and I think I remember one time um, in maybe 1980, when in 81, when Jane Burns said she was going to do something for public housing, I think that was the first time re mainstream reporters mm -hmm. actually walked into a public housing building. Mm -hmm. And they were afraid. Yeah. They would not go there. And even Mayor Byrne, when she moved in, wouldn't mo go there without a police escort and having a limo to drive her up to the door. And they, they literally had to cut a tree down so she could get her limo close to the door. So they were afraid, like some sniper was going to shoot her. Yeah. Um, now we've been just slowly, you know, that nobody's cared about them. They abandoned them. Um, now we're tearing them down. I think it's a good thing, but why are we tearing it down? Because some land developers are going to take that land and they're going to turn it into Riverview or they're going to turn it into a new Disney World. It's about money. Yeah. That's all it is, and it's sad. Mm -hmm. The Nobody number seven seven. seven the That's number seven seven three four eight seven three six three zero. I want to talk about. Target. Target may be the, built on this site, uh, according go. to published reports. Right. Even though some row houses remain, many consider this the end of Cabrini Green, judged by history as one of the most not notorious housing projects in the country. This is a, a story uh, uh, in the Chicago Tribune today. So prime real estate, we know that Cabrini Green sits on. Mm -hmm. prime. Do we really need a Target there? There's one, close, the one on Roosevelt Road, not that far away. Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's another one around there. So. Do we really need a target? Well, but on the other on hand, it, it'll bring jobs to other people in that area. But then, area. what about housing? And, uh, well, that's that's the other question. I mean, and certainly these are the type of things that we that must be looked at. I mean, they can't just, as you were saying, I wouldn't even support just cutting someone a check and saying, "Okay, now toddle off and go away." Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've they, we've taken care of these they people for built years. The, like, they should have built the target though. When the people were living right. in Cabrini, exactly. Green, exactly. there we go. Exactly. Not today when they're but gone. Also, I mean, what does this that is tell you, though? This about is something to, to help solve the food desert idea, where there's no grocery stores and, and things like that. In, in, but again, in, in would have been most areas, effective. But, exactly. While the you, residents were still there. You know what really troubles me, and I, I'm a broken record when it comes to this. I cannot stand when crime is rampant in certain communities. That just really, really upsets me. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Cabrini Green back in the day, visiting a friend of mine. And he said, Gerard, before you even get near here, hide your jewelry. So he had me put my jewelry, you know, he said, take it off or put it underneath your T-shirt. Mm -hmm. He said, if you have any other valuables, leave them in the car, you know, or leave them at home. And he said, when you walk up the staircase, if the elevator is broke, <coughs> do not look at anyone. Now, now think, of, now think about this. Think about that type of existence. Yeah. You have to hide your valuables, and we'll right. get to this iPhone death later. Hide your valuables. You can't look at anyone, and you're in constant fear. Mm -hmm. Kathy, do people have to live like that? Come on now. No, they don't have to, but unfortunately, in some areas, you do have to. You have to be aware of your surroundings, and this happened to me today. What? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. What happened? Talk to us. Well, I was uh, going to Target on 87th Street to um, get some Dr. Pepper. If anyone knows me, I'm a Dr. Pepper fan. Mm -hmm. And there's a guy in the parking lot, and he's asking people, do you have 50 cents so I can get on a bus? you have a dollar so I can get on a bus? Me, I don't have anything. I keep going. I'm in Target. I decide to take the long way to the soda aisle, and I look at the magazines, and I look up, and he's standing right next to me. I say, oh, no, we won't be having this. Yeah. And he got out the store immediately. Yeah. See, I can't stand panhandlers. Sometimes the panhandler has more money than I have at the time. Exactly. Shaking a little cup Because you around. don't know who really needs the help and who's running right. the scam. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that ruins it for the people who really right. do need the assistance. Right. But, but the real problem, though, is that nobody pays attention. I mean, we give them police protection, but what else do we do for them? The me when, you, when the media, I think it starts with the media because I'm, I've been in the media. Uh, we never did a good job of telling the story what, about what life was really like. If we made life, you know, if we, we covered life, no. and we still don't, no, definitely not. but if we really covered them, I think there'd be more interest, more concern, um, more feelings on their part that somebody cares. Right. They might, you know, I don't know, things might have been different, but yeah. we don't treat the poor very well. Uh, we want to shuffle them out of the way. We want to put them around on, in a small area. And then when we go into that area, we put them in. We feel like we can't trust them with our valuables. Yeah, you know right? what? And, and I had the same situation here myself. I, I used to work just down on Green Street, uh, just south of uh, Comiskey Park. And, uh, you know, 
every one of us had our cars broken into at mm. one point or another because people were leaving things on their seat or you know windshields busted in uh, uh, hoods rolled up and batteries stolen and you know you think to yourself well, you know why 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 mm. just here yeah right. yeah you know, and why, when you're, why just here but when your quality of life <clears throat> varies from neighborhood to neighborhood sometimes you question even here in the united states whether you're even a respected human being i mean is this truly the land of the free home of the brave. Let's go to some phone calls now. You can call me at 773-487-3630. I've got Melville on the phone. Melville, thanks for calling off 63rd. What's your comment, Melville? Uh, good evening. Good evening. I, I worked service connected when they first started tearing the projects down. And a lot of those residents, this is the early 2000s, a lot of those residents wound up in Peoria or Decatur because that's where Section 8 housing was readily available. At the time, there was a two- or three-year waiting list for Section 8 housing in Chicago. I think it's interesting, I think it needs to be noted, that the idea to tear projects down didn't gather any momentum until suburbanites began moving back to Chicago. Oh. Uh, and condos going, condos going up like grass. <laughs> they need that land. They need that land. It's location, location, location. Yes. It, you got transportation, you got education, you got recreation. Um, you know, they were a bad idea from the beginning. Warehousing, warehousing uh, poor people uh, where you can keep an eye on them. Hey, it's a, it's a Mel, Melville, thanks for the call. I appreciate that. Wow, great phone call. You look at housing projects being dismantled, people going to the suburbs, finding a landlord that accepts Section 8, the dreaded S8. Wonderful concept, doesn't always work for some communities. Then people say, hmm, honey, would you like to move back to the quote unquote inner city? Let's move to the near west or south side. As Melville said, beautiful condos. Was this some sort of conspiracy or plot? What do you guys think? If you look at the census uh, over the last 10 years, we still lost 200,000 residents in the city. Mm. So uh, I'm not and so those are, and a lot of them, I think, were minorities could have moving them. into the suburbs. Right. And, uh, and <clears throat> it's kind of unusual because the economy didn't make it easy to make that jump. So what was pushing them there? Yeah. What was moving them there? I, I don't know. So Cost of crime. living, possibly. And what's interesting, too, is even with the nice condos that are downtown and in the near west and the near south, some of those prices have gone down considerably oh, in the yeah. last well, year, year yeah. and a half, two yeah. years. Well, the system still has a flaw. And, um, <laughs> and I don't mean to be the bad guy here, but they give them money to move someplace, Section 8, support, whatever. They go into a suburb, and what happens? They're pushed into little corners of the suburb. You go to a lot of suburbs, and what do you find? You hear p people talking about, well, we got that public housing, and it's a defined area. The, the whole concept was wrong. They should have let people spread out, use it to move out, instead of being so identifiable to create this fear factor. Mm -hmm. Let people just move in any place, yeah. and I don't think it would be as bad. You know, what's really sad, though, is, and it reminds me of a hip-hop album by Public Enemy called Fear of a Black Planet. Mm -hmm. And we still, to this day, 2011, we're dealing with ethnicity consciousness, we're dealing with color consciousness, we're mm -hmm. dealing with fear of the unknown. Xenophobia at its finest. And it's just sad that that still exists. I got to transition on topics here, you guys. Well, I'm going to do a book called Fear of the Arab Planet. That's <laughs> the one I'm working on next. And you know what? Let's go to Libya right now. Right. Uh, <laughs> President Obama, uh, what's the reasoning for United States actions in Libya at this point? Uh, the CIA is there now. They're saying, oh, it's a no-fly zone, but the United States and England and others can fly jets in there. Easy. I'm going to go to you first, though, Kathy. Uh, Louis Farrakhan, the minister, has made some comments, and he's almost comparing or almost using a parallel of when he called uh, Hitler wickedly great. He's saying something similar about Gaddafi. He's kind of praising Gaddafi right now. Uh, Minister Farrakhan, is he right or wrong? Talk to me, Kathy Cheney. Uh, I don't want to say he's right or wrong, but you know, this, is, this is what we hear from him. This yeah. is what we hear from him. It's normal. Um, we expect to hear from him. I don't think we expect to hear anything different. Yeah. That's the thing. So was anyone surprised at what he said? Absolutely not. 